You know, one of the most encouraging things in the Gospel of Mark that we see about Jesus is, is, that, is that Jesus receives everybody who pursues him. Everybody who pursues him. I mean, he makes, he makes time for religious outcasts and, and unclean people and individuals who have no religious significance, nobody who can, who can build him up or make his, 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 his messianic movement any greater. He receives everybody. In fact, he's more often than not intentionally pushing outside of the, the comfortable boundaries that we want to live in out to grab the people who are on the outside. And probably one of the more convicting things about the Gospel of Mark, if we read it closely and we're honest, is, is that you and I are often more like the 12 disciples than we are like Jesus. Jesus. It's, it's a truth. We're kind of more like the 12. See, we want to be great. I mean, we're in the section about true greatness. We want to be great. But what we settle for, for being thought of as being great or simply being greater than other people. Instead of the tri- kind of true greatness that Jesus is talking about where it's found in serving the least. And even worse, over time, we can be tempted to think that acceptance before God and how God looked at, looks at me is a matter of my personal accomplishments, not grace. We begin to think all the things that we've done stack up and that God is considering those and, and that he's considering those even more than he's considering his son. And even though we might never admit it, I think sometimes we fall into the trap of believing that we actually deserve God's forgiveness you know, in some way that other people do not deserve his forgiveness. Deep down inside, as we look at the world and we see the things going on, we see the toxicity of sin, we can think we deserve it more than everybody else. But that couldn't be any farther from the truth of the gospel. I mean, the main idea, the main point of our text this morning is this. Whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Simple quotation today. Mark chapter 10, verse 15. That's the main idea. And and that's a dire warning. But at the same time, it's a beautiful promise. So let's, let's, let's dig into this a little bit more today. We're going to break up, kind of like really focus on three verses. We're going to see the disciples' arrogance in verse 13, the Savior's anger in verse 14, and then we're going to see the gospel's demand in verse 15. So let's go to verse 13 to begin with. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. We'll just stop there for a minute. Now, now notice that Mark isn't very interested in telling us uh, about the people who are bringing their kids to Jesus. And for Mark, that's kind of surprising because he loves to give us 10 verses of backstory. I mean, he gives us all sorts of information that the other gospel writers don't give us. And here we got just, we got they, not even parents, not grandparents, we're not sure who, but probably parents and grandparents, bringing kids to Jesus. He doesn't tell us about the hopes in bringing them to Jesus. They're just bringing them to Jesus. Now we see later on Jesus Jesus grabs them and and hugs them. But but I think he does this because he wants us to, he wants to expose a continuing deficiency in the 12. The parents and the children are not the focal point. The 12 are the focal point. See, he wants us to see the disciples They haven't been listening to what Jesus has been teaching for the past chapter. 
This, this, this whole conversation about true greatness, this whole conversation about not pushing people away and the warning of hell, I mean, all of these warnings, he's just given them, and what are they doing? They're continuing to push people away from Jesus. I mean, I mean their actions are no different than they were when they, when they censured that, that, that Jewish exorcist back in chapter 9, verse 38. Same exclusion. And we might look at this and go, well, you know, maybe they're protecting Jesus from just the interruptions that kids can be, right? I mean, kids are kids, they're rambunctious, they're fun, they butt in, but that's not the case at all. I mean, Jesus here isn't teaching. He's not in a crowd teaching. People are bringing their kids to Jesus. What the disciples are doing is they're restricting access to Jesus to demonstrate their own personal importance. Hey, we're the gatekeepers here. I mean, they're like the bouncer at the front door. That, that's what they're trying to be. We're important around here, and, and you need to come to us if you want to come to Jesus. That's what they're doing. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. You know, one of the other things I love about Mark is he never, ever softens the human emotions of Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully man and fully God. He, he has the full emotional spectrum that you and I have. And here also he doesn't, he doesn't hide the failure of the disciples at the same time. And Jesus is clearly angry at the disciples because this is the only passage in the four Gospels where Jesus is said to be indignant. And we're talking about being indignant here. We're talking about being aroused to such anger that he instantly expresses his displeasure. Jesus is angry, and he's angry at his guys. But at the same time, it reveals the heart of Jesus. Who is Jesus caring about? He's caring about these vulnerable, powerless, and seemingly unimportant people. And it's children. See, back in chapter 9, we... we, we, we we connected with this idea in the first century where, where children kind of fit in the societal spectrum. And, and, and it's, this isn't to say that first century people didn't love their kids, they loved their kids. But, but the reality is, is that, that the culture as a whole believed that children were insignificant, they were, they were unworthy un, of substantial attention because they weren't able to contribute to society. The person's ability to contribute to society or, or to give somebody greater honor, those were the important things, and kids don't have an ability to do that. All kids do is take and receive and constantly need more, right? That's kids. So we see here the disciples have a problem, and it's at least twofold. Number one, it's clear they're still operating under, under their sinful, self-centered ideas of what it means to be great. Okay, so that's, that's one of their biggest problems. They're still operating this mindset. It hasn't changed yet. But the other thing is, is, is not only are they, are they wrong in their actions and their understanding of what true greatness is, they're wrong about Jesus. They've been with him all this time, and they're, they're wrong about Jesus. They seem to think that Jesus can't be bothered by these interruptions of these little kids. He, he's too busy with his super important messianic work that he's got to do. Have these little kids climbing all over him. And it's just, it's just ironic. They see, they, they see themselves as protectors of Jesus. They, they see that they, they have, they're so warped in their understanding, they think they're protecting Jesus. Yet by rejecting these children, they're in fact rejecting Jesus himself. Remember what he's already taught? When you receive the least significant person in my name, you're receiving who? Me. 
And if you're receiving me, who are you receiving? The one who sent me. They haven't learned. Serving the least of all people in Jesus' name is actually serving the greatest. That's what Jesus wants them to know, and that's what they're not getting. And so they've pushed all these kids out to the outside and said, you're not important to Jesus. Now, before we go to verse 15, I want to pull a couple implications out. And, and when I say implication, implication means there's some ideas that, that come out of the text that are not the main point of the text, okay? So, but I want to bring a couple of these implications out for us in our church. Then we'll move on to the direct application where Jesus is going. If Jesus cares so much about children, children's ministry needs to be a priority in the local church. It's not optional. It's not convenient child care. It's ministry. See, children's ministry is the very means by which we introduce our children to Jesus Christ and we help them understand their desperate need for Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not about crafts. It's not just about stories. We want to make sure that our kids hear the gospel time again throughout their entire life. We want them all the way from from the youngest age all the way through 18 to be hearing the gospel over and over and over again. We don't want it to take it for granted that, 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 that they're a Christian because they're going to church. Children's ministry is also the means by which we partner with the parents of believing children. What what are we doing in children's ministry? But we're helping them build these kids up in the faith by anchoring them in sound doctrine. We, we, want, we, want, we, want, we also want to be modeling the, the, what it means to be a mature Christian for these kids. Having other teachers besides their own parents helps them see what other Christians kind of look like. And we all have different gifts, and we have different strengths and different levels of maturity, and we get exposed to all of that as our kids, or I should say our kids are getting exposed to all of that as they're growing through, and they get to see Jesus work in different people's lives. And the reality is, like all spiritual gifts, some have a little better teaching gift than others. But it's not only about teaching, it's about seeing how is the gospel lived out in everyday life. And the third thing that we want to be doing is preparing them, preparing them for the world that they're going to be launched into when they finish high school whether they're going right into college, whether they're going into the workforce. We, we want to supply the things that they need to help them succeed in life. But, but now here's the key point. That's if they're a believer to begin with. That's why the gospel is important all the way through. We want to make sure that, that they're actually true believers, not just a kid who's learned a whole lot about what the Bible says, and what the church is about, but has zero faith in Jesus Christ. And we can do a good job at teaching kids about Jesus in a way that they never received Jesus. I've told our team countless times, never assume the gospel. You know the parents, we don't know with the kids, keep the gospel coming. They need to hear it. Second thing, implication-wise, if children's ministry is so important and if children are important to Jesus, which they are, then no one is too important to serve in children's ministries. No, no one is too important to serve in children's ministries. And most churches, especially smaller churches, have kind of grown up with an idea that, that moms 
and, and young adults do children's ministry, and that when you're no longer a mom, you don't do children's ministry anymore because that's the thing that you used to do when you had kids. And, and it's, like, it's like that's not the mindset that we have here. And we don't, we don't want to cultivate that. We want to we wanna say, we love our kids. I mean, and, and, and even more, moving past our women who are serving, encouraging grandmothers and mothers, who, I mean, and, and women who don't have kids anymore to serve, men to serve. The most powerful thing in a classroom of kids 18 and under is men who are passionate about Jesus. Because they see men who are passionate about football, men who are passionate about hunting, they see men who are passionate about fishing, men who are passionate about their jobs and about getting advancements at work. They need face-to-face interaction with a man who's passionate about Jesus. Men who don't serve out of duty just because their wife told them they needed to serve in there or because Pastor Mark made him feel guilty so they're serving in there. But, but men, men who realize that I'm serving Jesus right now when I'm serving these kids. I'm serving Jesus. Because that's what you're doing. Anybody's work with our kids is just as important as the work that the elders do. I do want to say that there's a number of men that have been serving. And I have, I have, a, I have a list right here, and I've just realized I probably don't want to take the time going through it all. But we have a number of men that have been serving. So it's not that we don't have any, but I'm encouraging more to jump into the pool. So let's move back to the text itself. I wanted to do this here because Jesus' primary focus in the text, it, it's not on literal, literal children as he develops. So that's why I wanted to talk about our ministries here. Jesus is transitioning to physical children to spiritual children. He, he's transitioning to anyone, anyone who's trying to gain access to him. That, that's the, the transition that he's making here. Mark chapter 10, verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. See, the word such in here tells us that Jesus is now flipping the script. Jesus is saying that there's a necessary correlation or a necessary analogy between literal children coming to him and the kind of person that receives the kingdom of God. Okay, and that's where our ears should perk up. What kind of person receives the kingdom of God? What, what's, what's the connection as we think about children and the kind of person that receives the kingdom? Is it their innocence? Is it their gentleness? Is it their purity? Well, if we look closely at the story in chapter 9 that we saw before, Jesus didn't receive the kids for the virtues that they possessed. And that's the same case here. Jesus isn't receiving them for what they possess. He's receiving them for everything that they lack. He's receiving these kids for what they lack. They're small, they're powerless, they're unsophisticated, they're unimportant, and they're generally ignored. That's the kind of person that Jesus is talking about, that receives the kingdom. Let's go to verse 15. He develops it further. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So this is the, this is the place where I, I just want to encourage everybody to pay attention and listen up. If you've heard the gospel a million times in your life, let's hear it again. Kids, if you've been thinking about the gospel, you're wondering, what does it mean to be right with Jesus? This is the place to listen up. What kind of person receives the kingdom of God? That's the question. Now, notice Jesus is saying that there's a kind of person 
that thinks that they're receiving the kingdom and they're not receiving the kingdom. And there's a kind of person that is actually receiving the kingdom because they're receiving it like a child. That's an important difference. The question is, do you know which one you are? And the key is this. A child has nothing to bring. Children have nothing to bring to the equation. Therefore, anybody coming to receive the kingdom, you're not bringing anything. Children receive things because of their sheer neediness, not their personal influence, not, not their merits, not their accomplishments. So, so receiving the kingdom here, like a child, means that everybody who receives the kingdom comes to God empty-handed. Not bringing anything in an offering to God. No credits, no clout, no works, no hopes in anything else. They come empty handed because God doesn't follow the world's rules. And that's where we have our problem is, is, is we think it should operate like the world and God doesn't operate like the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's what Paul's saying. This is how it works. Paul is saying God does not grant special favor, peop, special favor to people with superior wisdom. Smart people don't have a special break. Neither do people with authoritative power. Neither do people with, with influential family lineages. None of that matters when it comes to receiving the gospel. Rather, he's a God who intentionally chooses foolish, weak, lowly, and despised people to magnify his infinite grace. That's who our God is. So let's just drill down into a couple of these categories for a moment. Let's just try to, try to bring this home a little bit further. Is your hope of forgiveness and restoration to God grounded in your personal wisdom or your understanding about God? And, and I actually probably want to focus more on the second because here in the church, as I think about kids that grow up in the church and even young adults, often the reason that they think that they are right with God is because they know so many things about God. They have biblical knowledge. They know the books of the Bible. They know the storyline of the Bible. They, they, have, they have doctrinal expertise. They, they've learned about key doctrines, and some of them have ironclad apologetics, knowing how even to defend the faith of the gospel against people who, who are attacking it. And, and their faith, though, is not ultimately in Jesus. It's in the stuff that they know. But it's never been received by faith. And if this is you this morning, you, you, you need to know that God is not, pardon me, that knowing God is not the same thing as knowing about God. Knowing about God is not the same thing as truly knowing God. See, see 1 Corinthians says this in, in chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So you see, God has not hidden himself in such a way that only a few smart people can find him. That's the thing. It's not just for smart people. I mean, God, God doesn't hide himself in codes, and he doesn't hide himself in weird, esoteric knowledge. You don't have to go find it in a cave somewhere. He says, no, no, God reveals it in the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. God freely reveals to the entire planet, every man, woman, and child who's heard the gospel, he reveals it the same way. The message that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for your sins, and that God will forgive you if you turn and trust in Jesus. That, that's the heart of the gospel. There's no other way. There's no other thing. It's the only way, really, that anybody can truly know God is through the gospel. How about good deeds and righteous works to use our biblical language? There's a lot of people that put their hope in what they do. And, and, and there's kind of two, 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 pe- two groups of people when it comes to this. There, there's a group of people who, who, are, who endeavor to follow every single rule in the Bible, and they think that by this, this really difficult obedience that they're following to God, that God is, is going to then respond to them in a way that he does not respond to other people. That they're bringing their goodness to God, and sure, they're coming in faith, they come to faith in Jesus, but they're really bringing something else. And on the other hand, there's people who are perpetually trying to clean up their life because it's so broken and it's such a mess and they look at the righteousness of God and instead of being like the person who comes with all of their good works in their hand, they're the person who's convinced that they can never come to God because they're so disgusting in their sin and they've failed so much that they need, they need to overcome that in some way before God will listen. But that's a lie. Nobody, nobody can be good enough for God's approval. Not a person on this planet has ever been good enough for God's approval. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But see, that's where, that's where the person who's looking at righteous works also has to realize the empty-handedness of faith. We, we, we don't come with, with works. We don't come saying, God, look how much I've cleaned my hands. We come empty, we come with dirty hands. And we come to him that he might cleanse us, not our works. And when we do that, our righteousness is Jesus himself. Romans 3, 21 through 24 but now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. There is no distinction. That's the beauty of the gospel. Righteousness of God through faith, zero distinction. Any distinction that you think exists is inaccurate. It doesn't exist. No distinction. Why? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption in Jesus Christ. The ground is level at the cross, and that means that fastidious rule keepers 
and moral degenerates and people that have lived a broken life of addiction all come to Jesus Christ the same way. Like a child. Number three. Some people's hope and forgiveness, and this can maybe sometimes be kids a little bit more than others, somehow think that their parents' faith and their parents' commitment to Jesus and their parents' activity in church somehow applies to them. It's kind of like kind of like if you went to the airport with your mom and dad and they each bought a ticket and you tried to get on the airplane and you have four people and two tickets, who's going to get on the airplane? The people with the two tickets in their name. The people without tickets aren't allowed to board. In the same way, kids... If you have not come to faith in Jesus Christ, you will not know Jesus Christ and you will not enter the kingdom. Parents, remember this, please, as you're raising your kids. They need to come to this realization. Nobody gets in on the merits of somebody else. The door is open. Romans 10, 9 clearly says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive. Oh, Romans 10, 9, sorry. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Trust in Jesus, not in your parents when it comes to everlasting life. All three of these, how do we come to Jesus? We come empty-handed in each case. This, this is what it means to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. We have nothing to bring, and whatever we receive, we receive it every single time by grace. And this is why, this is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is on one hand foolishness and on the other hand it's a stumbling block. People hear this message and they reject it. It just doesn't make sense to me that it could work that way. Or they look at it from another perspective and say, it's, there's no way that can be. Look at how good I am. Why would God make it work that way? Why wouldn't God accept me as I am? It's like, no, that's a stumbling block. We don't bring anything to God in such a way that we rightly deserve His forgiveness. So this morning, I just want to close with a single question. And the question is this, is have you actually received you, not somebody sitting next to you, have you actually received the kingdom of God? This is the focal point of Jesus' entire ministry. This is, this is the reason he came. This is the reason he's doing miracles and he's teaching and it's the reason he's going to die on the cross at the end of the book and be raised again. I mean, remember how he began his ministry in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15? After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God, and saying, the time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, now what do we need to do? Repent and believe the gospel. That's his ministry. Because the kingdom is here, what do you need to do? Don't miss it. Don't, don't, don't mistake it for something else. Don't have your hope in something else. He, he says, what do you got to do? Repent and believe. And when we think of repentance and belief, I think of them as two sides of one coin, okay? 
Repentance means, what are we doing? That we're turning away from our sinful self-centeredness and we're fully acknowledging that we're wholly unworthy of God's affection and that we have nothing to offer him. The only thing that we bring when we come to Jesus Christ is our sin. That's repentance. Repentance isn't, God, I'm not going to sin anymore. Would you do something for me? We can't make that promise. Even when we repent of the things that we are currently doing, it doesn't mean that we're not going to stumble back into them. No, repentance is God. I'm not trusting in anything. It's your sin that you bring to the cross. And it's his grace that you find at the cross. But see, in coming, let's, let's go back here. In coming with our sin to God, it doesn't stop there. God, I have, I have nothing I can do to please you. Here's, here's, here's me in all my sin. It doesn't stop there. That's repentance. I'm empty-handed. We believe. Repent and believe. Believe. What's belief? It means that we embrace God's promise that he freely forgives and he freely restores everyone who comes to him in faith. Everyone who trusts in his promise. That's belief. We're turning away from anything in us acknowledging we have no reason to receive anything from God, but that God has made a glorious promise in the gospel that all my sin is wholly forgiven in Jesus Christ. And I can be restored and you can be restored to him when you come and say, Jesus, forgive me. I give up trying to do it myself. I want to be yours. Cleanse me and make me yours. It's how we receive the kingdom. And it's how anybody's received it from the very first day. So my question is, have you? Have you done it? you haven't, I'll be up here in the front with some people from our prayer team. We'll be happy to talk with you. This is the only thing that matters in life. Don't miss it. Father, this morning...